And thank you everyone for being astonishingly punctual. It's exactly 12.30. Um, you may well have seen the description for this event. Uh, this is Elliot. Uh, he works at Deloitte Systems Integration. Uh, and you will find out what that means in just a moment. Uh, and I don't think I need to do any more introductions than that. Um, Deloitte SI are hiring at the moment, so you will find them at the careers fair tomorrow uh, if you're coming along. Otherwise, let's give it up for Elliot. Thank you very much. Um, so, as Will said, my name is Elliot. I'm part of Deloitte, specifically the Deloitte uh, SI bit of Deloitte. Um, so I'm going to run through what that means, um, what it's like to work at Deloitte, uh, specifically what it's like to work at uh, large-scale agile deliveries. So I know a lot of people here are familiar with agile, um, but really what happens when we do this at scale with big clients that we can work with. Um, I'll drop into a little bit of architecture patterns and the development roles that go on with different patterns. Um, and that's, that's about it really. Um, the reason for this talk is, is kind of stemmed from uh, people at Makers learn a lot of JavaScript and a lot of Ruby. Um, and the obvious path, if you know a lot of JavaScript and Ruby, and you think, what, what do I want to do as a developer? So you visualize the front end. I want to be a developer. I'm going to build something that a user would see, because that's the most um, obvious kind of jump in terms of what you might build. Uh, and I'm hoping that this kind of talk will allow people to uh, see the kind of bigger picture when we build things at scale, specifically, what, what is there? Like we have front-end architecture for what kind of sits behind it, why does it sit behind it, why do we need to do it, how does it work, uh, and then how, how do we scale that so we have apps and sites that we host across the globe for clients, how do we make sure that they're working as we think they're working, and how do we know that, and what do we do, and how do we find out, and, and um, that's kind of what I'll jump into. Um, as I said, life at Deloitte, we have a lot of clients, we're, we're a massive organisation, a global organisation, we have clients that we're to represent that. I've got two examples here that I'll run through in more detail. These are real clients of ours that, that we've worked with. Um, and before I jump in, if there are questions, just wave at me or shout them out or stick your hand up or um, kind of flows more if people are wondering things. I imagine other people are also wondering the same thing. So you can help each other out just by calling at the time rather than um, waiting. So that in mind, are there any questions before we jump in? I didn't come to make this. I work closely with people that we've brought in for events. One or two of you will probably meet tomorrow. Um, any other questions? Sorry, I missed it. What role do you play? Uh, I'm a tech leader at Deloitte. Um, so specifically, I work more within DevOps and test engineering. Um, and as we kind of go through the architecture stuff, you'll see more of the um, detail of the stuff that we have to do. So, Deloitte um, Digital do a bit more front-end work and API work. Deloitte SI will you kind of see as we go forth, but um, we do more of the um, back office work. And how does the system work together and how can we set up to, to use it? <coughs> cool. Okay, so this first diagram is obviously nothing in the middle, and after actually add bits to it and kind of talk through it. Um, is uh, a client of ours who were a national bank. Um, we worked with them for about a year and a half, um, and they wanted to um, digitize their um, image. So specifically, they were looking to have accounts that people um, could open online, uh, and they wanted to give customers uh, an app, so an iOS and an Android app that people could feel and hold, and the kind of um, message for that was that was help people manage their, their money a bit more bit better than more easily. Um, so obviously with that we build, build a web app to help, this is predominantly to help people um, uh, open accounts online uh, and then an iOS app and an Android app as well and this was um, more of the everyday management of uh, people's, people's accounts. <coughs> um, and this is kind of the, the front end, so obviously you're well up here, we, we, we obviously we built some JavaScript and this objective scene, this was built up in Java. Um, and with that come a number of microservices. Um, and these are kind of example architectures. The reality is there's many of these, it's a bit more complicated, but it, it's, it, it 
gives a representation of what um, you can build. And I imagine the first one, a lot of people have probably done something similar, similar to in some kind of way already. Um, so, for example, an example of microservices, you might have something which handles payments. Um, so your web app or your iOS app can say, um, I am this person and I need to pay someone. Go to the payments services that would then go to um, the core banking platform that we're building a structure around. And it would say, uh, this person is authorised, they would like to send this amount of money to this account. And this service would be pay for that. And this allows us to build on top of the core banking platform, which a lot of banks have um, built and developed a system that um, was designed and built a long time ago um, that doesn't necessarily work with today's modern agile practices. Um, and a lot of them are kind of scared about doing things to it because they don't want to change it because it's always worked. And if they start changing it, they're not sure how it's going to behave. And uh, specifically, the infrastructure around it isn't written as code, so it's kind of it's kind of old tech that people are concerned about touching. So we, we often build microservices layer in front of it to allow people to communicate and allow us to manage this, which makes this a little bit more <coughs> Um, so I've, I've represented this as just a black box, and that's for this talk kind of all we care about is, uh, um, is the core of the bank, and it holds all of their data about who people are and how much money they have in different accounts. And that's kind of a black box we speak with through the API. We also have a little database here that the API will store the information that it needs. But obviously, if you're moving money, you need to push that into the core bank. You can't store things there. Are there any questions about that before I introduce a few more? Maybe? So, again, these are just arbitrary examples of how the, the architecture can work, but we have another service called user services. This would be, for example, um, uh, get the um, users that I know in my account. So if you've saved certain people's bank accounts and you regularly wipe the money, you, you might say, get, get the users that I know as this user. Um, you'd also have authorization. So when you're logging into the app, you've got to authorize it yourself. Um, and two other ones, just for um, an example, are chat services. Um, so you might have people on, on all three of these platforms that want to speak to real people. Uh, where's my refund? Uh, what's going on with this payment? Like you might interfere that with the chat API and blog services. You might want to display a blog as well. Um, and the reason that we abstract the API layer from the front end layer, and this is probably two reasons. One is by abstraction, we don't want to store this in one place, so we don't want to have any of that logic here. And also security, we don't want people to download code that shows how do I authorize against this bank, so they can take the uh, app apart and <coughs> take the code apart, and it's a bit of security for um, So in this case, it makes a lot of sense that you, you kind of hold your API layers, and then separately you hold your web app, your iOS app, your Android app, because they all abstract, or you all um, use the same logic around your APIs and how you interface with the bank. Um, and the last one on this is a quick go of the, of the tech that we use, which I've kind of touched on already. So the um, APIs were in in Java. We had the Postgres database, uh, Android Java app, and Objective-C app, and um, a JavaScript React web app, which I would imagine a lot of people have seen JavaScript and React and see some people working on it. Um, and the last one I put is a smiley face because I never forget to talk about this. Um, this this is a real app. This is I looked at this on the App Store last night. Um, had 4.6 stars, 11, 12,000 reviews of the latest version. This this is something we've served to customers. It's something that's used daily. It's something that people use to manage their money, um, which is great as as a dev because you've built something and you can see people use it at scale. Um, which is a really, it's a really cool thing to do, and it's a, it's a really good thing to um, see the effect of. We can kind of scroll through the, the ratings and see how people have seen it. And it's, it's been a while since we um, built this, and we handed it back to the business along with the, the pipeline that deploys it. But it's, um, it, it, is, it is a real app, and it's in use, and it's, it's enjoyed. Um, so again, I'm going to jump onto the second one now, and I'm going to jump into that in a bit more detail. Any questions that people want to ask about this one? Yeah. Just one about the client, actually. Um, so they obviously have an internal IT team that are able to maintain and manage the product you have. In fact, uh, what, what are the kind of reasons that they would choose to outsource the actual development <coughs> to somebody else? Is it just a question of size? That, that's a really good question. So 
its scale, um, and it is um, Deloitte operate at the very high cost, high quality end of the market, and clients bring us in because they can't staff something themselves, or they wouldn't know how to start staffing it themselves. But the challenge of maintaining infrastructure and uh, the uh, uh, back and down and front of that is easier than the challenge of designing something and building it. Um, so we build things in um, in a certain way that allows us to hand it to the client. Um, but we do hand things back because uh, not all clients want to uh, pay like the high cost, high quality fee the whole time. We generally come along, build something, make it sustainable, and either hand it back or create like a level service like the life support team for them. That's a good question. straight into a base space. Whereas but if they didn't necessarily want you messing around with um, their existing platform, which obviously doesn't make sense with so much resting on it, um, there must have been some tinkering that would have to happen in there in order for it to accept the requests from the APIs and right. So did they have their internal team change those things or did they give you like a little bit of access? Or was there a way to do it without needing to touch it at all? So to kind of take a step back from this specific example Every project kind of works differently. It depends what the client wants. Sometimes um, the client <coughs> give us client maps that we write and we build their stuff, and that is a bit more integrated. Uh, in this specific example, they had an internal team that were helping expose the bits of this that we needed if they weren't exposed, uh, and then we could call them to it. The reality is, this black box is a collection of different um, projects within the client who are already speaking to each other. So we just make sure, and again, I don't talk too much about networks and stuff, but we make sure we have access to the endpoints we need, and it might just be that it <coughs> exists already, we just need to open that bit of the network. And they're happy opening this bit of the network to this, because this lives on the client side, because they would never open it up to here, because all the users would be able to hit that endpoint and they can pick it up. Yeah? That's fine, you think. What is that, hello? <laughs> It's quite a terrifying smiley face. <laughs> um, this is just happy customer stuff, but it's, it's, it is pretty terrifying. <laughs> it's just more to remind me to talk about um, the fact that real customers use it, and you can see them use it, and you can see the reviews, and you can see people processing data, and that kind of thing. And it's, like, it's cool building stuff, but actually if you look up and see what you've done over the last uh, year or so, you think, oh, actually, we've built this thing, and real customers are using it, and it's helping them. So what uh, example is this one that are you using for like, classified information? Or? Yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's a national bank um, that we digitalize. But, um... Quick question, do you ever end up working with a system which is not run very well on their end, and, or like maybe archaic technology or has some security problems and you've got to try and oh, work yeah. out how to make that work? Oh, yeah. Clients don't bring us in because they know all the answers. Um, so that's a, re a regular problem. Um, and, you know, the expectation from certainly the like, senior leader the leadership team and the client is come in and, uh, you know, you don't just build your thing, but there's a bit of expectation that we want everyone else to kind of learn from what you're doing and how, how can we evolve our ways of working as, as a client. And, um, but yeah, that's, that's good questions. So, what is like success with this then? Is it that? Scary happy customers, or is the client happy with what you've delivered? Which is the success? So that's a really good question as well. Um, and the answer is probably both, because they are the same thing. Presumably, it's unlikely that the client really wants something and then you build it perfectly and you give it to customers and we say we don't want it, because then the client's not. Yeah. Um, but there are a lot of agile methodologies like prototyping that you can use where you can build something that kind of doesn't work but looks like it might show it to all the people and say, do you want this, would you use it, we're about to open this kind of thing, um, let me know what you think, let me know what should change, and then as you develop it and iterate over it, then you'll end up with something that quite happy in the customer's end, and hopefully not that scary. You, you might have mentioned this at the very start, the sort of end-to-end -end from them coming to you, um, to you delivering this, and now it's on its whatever version, but like the, to the actual rollout, what was the sort of time scale for, for this digitalization? So, this is something we're talking about at the moment. 
we often start with a year's work, um, and the answer is probably a year and a half by the time we really push something out and do it. But it depends on this, without going into the project management stuff, but there's time, cost, quality, and you can freeze one of them. Um, so if the client has loads of budget and you want to put loads of people in, then we can build something quicker. Um, but we, uh, they generally try to set the scope and then the scope changes anyway because customers might want something different. For like twelve months past, this is all the money that's been done. Yeah, it certainly didn't happen overnight. Yeah. How many people are involved in building projects as such? So this team was a team of about <coughs> hundred ish, hundred and twenty. Uh, the next example as we jump on will is about the same size. Um, but this is uh, I can sense from the room that's kind of surprised a lot of people. It's <laughs> <laughs> Every, every team isn't huge, every team is small and agile, and I'm sure the same <laughs> size as what you're currently working in. So, that's a really good question, actually. So, we have one team that was building, um, again, and you can do it in different ways, but one team might build you, the user service API, another might just specialise in the payments API. One team might build the JavaScript app, another bit on the iOS app, and each team works iteratively within itself to build a product. And then you kind of have a layer above that to make sure everyone's doing the right thing and speaking to each other and they're not expecting a string instead of a, um, a null, or, you know, like integration problems between the, um, the different people. And ultimately, you know, are um, the people here, are they able to support the calls? And it's, but every team is, say, four to seven people. Ten would be a large team, but it's, if you have teams that are massive, it is difficult to manage. If you have releases that are big, it's, it's harder to manage. How much of the diagram you've got on the board is SI people versus digital people? Yeah, so it might be easier to answer that question after the second diagram, because I can talk a bit more around what happens in the background. But this is kind of the high level aspect of that. Are all the teams UK released? 250 to date in the UK? It's another good question, and it obviously depends on the client and what we're doing. It's going to be a recurring answer, I'm afraid. But in, again, in this specific example, we had teams in um, the client were actually based in Glasgow. Um, we had teams based in London, some people were going up to Glasgow, and other teams were based in Belfast. In the next example, we also have teams based in Bucharest. Um, so we, we have a lot of different offices in um, Deloitte, and we have people based in London, Belfast, and Bucharest, Dublin. Yeah? Was this test driven? Um, yeah, so th this was test driven to an extent, and the next example is much more test driven. Um, but yeah, we write tests up front, it's best practice. Yeah. Did you use um, Java because like, that's the best thing you should use for an API in an Android app, or is that because you should always like, specialize in that kind of language? Like, you know. So, that's another good question. So, there are often answers. So, the, the client have architecture teams that can help dictate a bit of what they want. Um, Java is the most commonly used language probably like in the development world. And for clients, it means it's easier to maintain things. It's easier to hire people that know Java. So we could have written all of this in Kotlin, as a good example, because Kotlin's cool. And it might have been really fun to learn and that kind of stuff. But then when we give it to the client, they go, it's really hard to hire Kotlin devs because there's just not many of them. Um, so a bit of what we do is that, and a bit of what we do is this is the correct architecture, this is how we design it. Um, so we have to listen to the client, obviously it's not entirely dictated. You've obviously got, well if there's 120 in teams of less than 10, at least a dozen teams, then I suspect your answer might say change based on client. But when you've got a physical office in Glasgow and you've got 120 people who could be based anywhere, would you try and put all of the teams in one physical location, whether that's London or Glasgow, or do you often have like each individual team split up? Sometimes teams are split up. Sometimes a team of four to seven people, most of the time a team of four to seven people is in a given location. Mm -hmm. uh, but sometimes uh, the development part of one team might be in one location, but team lead or management might be in one location. Um, but we never have everyone in, everyone in the same office across the board because it's expensive to move people around. So, um, let's jump into this. This is a, a central government department that we've been working with for some time. <coughs> um, the ask from them was, 
we're currently doing a load of application forms and they're paper-based and people are um, downloading the paper form, filling it out, sending it to us and we're then processing the form. Um, can, we can we digitize that? Can we make it more effective? Can we make it more efficient? Can we scale that across the globe? Um, and can it be cheaper than moving a piece of paper around and then faster and smarter? Um, and to just chuck a load of APIs on the board, again, this is an example, you know, there's five here. Um, one might be application services, so that lets let a, a user run end to end through an application. One might be uh, catalog services, so it might store um, a list of questions for each product. Um, so if the client says we want to serve all these products and these are the following questions that we need to be asking them depending on the product, that information can be stored uh, in a database that actually will speak directly to what they're posting and so that services. Uh, payments, if people want to pay, we have some to process payments. Something to submit before once it's done. And we also built um, file management service, which was a little API that had a, um, a web app on it as well, a, a view as part of the API that allowed the client to go. Um, one of our suppliers has um, got a production outage next week, we need to let people know. Let me put a banner up and they can notify people on different um, bits of different forms to say, What's going to happen? Please be aware this won't work in between these hours. This is going on. And it's a way of people you know, managing customers to make sure they can do what they need to do. Um, because the client wanted a, a website and not an app, uh, an Android and iOS app, it, it makes no sense architecturally to create a separate JavaScript web app that speaks to all these APIs because you're abstracting the front end needlessly in a way. You're, you're building something that actually one of the functionality that it does is here. So we just do that as a view within this API. If we had other components here that also needed to access it, it makes sense having them separately. Um, but architecturally, we can serve this much more simply, simply, um, simply by hosting a view in this API. Um, and simplicity is key. It's going to, we don't need to add complexity. It's going to make it harder to maintain. It's going to make it harder to manage. Um, and harder to debug as well. Um, let's introduce a couple of third parties. Does everyone, does everyone know what a third party is? Mm -hmm. Does everyone know why we might use a third party? Yeah. Is it sometimes share the risk, but also an organisation like World Bank, we specialise within transaction services, so it makes sense for them in their sweet spot to look after the transactions rather than you creating a whole system to support them? We don't need to reinvent the world every time. People have already done it. Does anyone know why it's a bad idea, like why it might be a bad idea to use third parties? Because then you share some of the risk with the third party, so if they make an error, then that's going to impact on your reputation. Yeah, you have dependencies. Yeah. Which also plays into why we built on that. Say, so example, WorldPay say, and WorldPay are huge pain for us, so they don't, but if they said, um, hey, we're going to have an outage between 1 and 2 a.m. tomorrow night, we can put a banner up saying payments won't work, and the payments are through during this time, and you know, people manage their expectations of what they want them to do. Um, I'll start introducing a few of the more, um, uh, more tech-based components that aren't APIs that people may or may not know about, but if I'm um, talking about something you haven't heard and it's not making sense, just start waving being old. The first being, we're using, is everyone familiar with AWS? Um, we have the market, but we're using Yeah. So it's, it's Amazon's web service, it's the uh, biggest cloud provider really. They um, have a number of kind of out-of-the-box services that um, allow people to use directly without having to build them. So this one, Specifically, is a, a mail server. We don't need to build a mail server from scratch. We can just um, spin up one very simply with Amazon, and they can um, uh, send emails for us without needing to really do anything. Um, SQS is a queuing system, so if we've got APIs that want to send things there and then wait, we don't need to block that thread in order to send it and wait and send it back. We can stick it on a queue, and then when it sends it back, we can get it from the, the, the delete, delete it from the queue, and it's a more performant way of managing things. Um, and again, I'll, I'll kind of gloss over these, but the, these are vault and console are ways of managing usernames and passwords. So um, if 
if I'm writing these, I don't want to hard code passwords. Specifically, I don't want to hard code passwords that are production passwords into Git and push them into Git because the client will be really unhappy about that. <laughs> um, so this is just a way this kind of says, go and get me my password, I am the production environment, and it will be able to find the password that needs to access databases. Um, and that as a whole is kind of what you might have-ish on, on a local uh, laptop. And I imagine a lot of people here have kind of built something already that kind of does the same thing. You might have an app, an API that does something with the database. You might call out to the Pasco hookup system. You might even use something that doesn't come um, already. And I'm going to spend a couple of minutes just kind of conscious of the time now. A couple of minutes talking about how we scale that to, to like, how, how do we scale that globally? How, how do we get it so production's always up? How do we get it so um, we don't pay for infrastructure that we're not using? We can't have a huge production environment all the time. If actually between midnight and 9 a.m. no one's on it, That's especially for the public sector, that, that, that they don't have the budget to, to really do that. Um, talk about um, if anything does happen in production, how do we know? Uh, and that is more what SI specialists specialise in to answer your question. Um, so, specifically, you, you might have, have different services on, on your dev laptop as you're running them. You might just run them in, uh, in dev mode, and that's great for um, your local host. But in prod, we can use some kind of containerization tool. So, in this example, we use Docker. Um, if I say Docker, to say that people know what it is, it's some. Some nods. Would someone like to have a go? Yeah. Containerization, like I said, so a lightweight virtual machine almost. Yeah. Um, and why would you use Docker over um, like having a specific virtual machine? Um, easy to deploy. Yeah. Very easy to deploy. Um, you can fix your environments, you wouldn't know them exactly the same kind of back end. Um, so yeah, I, I'd like to wait more performance. I agree with that. The reason, I think, so there are many, many reasons for it, but one of the biggest, in, in my mind, is immutability. So once you spin up a Docker image, it stays in that state. Or you kill it, and you can create another one, another <coughs> one in a different state. Um, and you know that if you have the same container, and you test it in test, it's going to be exactly the same as when you put it into prod. So you have all of the dependencies that you might um, need are kind of on your local machine that you might install with like Broom. You can install them on Docker and then you know it works as a image. Like it's not just the service it's running, it's where it's running and you can verify that and then you can put it into prod and you know it's going to be the same because you've tested exactly the image that you're moving. It means that all your separate teams who are all working on these things can all work essentially off the same set of base, sort of baseline things, right? Yeah. So, so that means that yeah, so you're basically sharing a, a, a fundamental one model. Yeah, absolutely. And Docker's also smart, so you can build one, one um, Docker container, one Docker image that says, go and get your service. But actually, if all of these are built in an example rather than Scala, they will um, <coughs> compile as a jar file. So it says, go and get me each jar, and you just make a variable with the service name, and everything else is the same. So this is going to behave the same as that. They'll all have the same dependencies, so they're all the same kind of curve. But actually, they do different things, but the framework is it's a certain extent. It's, it's simpler and easier to manage because you can abstract the logic of what you need it to do in other ways. Um, if we zoom out a bit now, and I'll add a few other things. So again, this is our prod environment. Um, actually, this kind of box isn't specifically prod because we don't, as a project, we don't own the client's back end. We, we work with it. We also don't own the third party, so, so our production environment is, is more like this. We then have a test environment, which is exactly the same way. We still have our third parties, again, same Docker containers. You know that they're going to test that they're also going to work in prod because they are same containers. And then we might have a um, internally integrated environment where you might pick up on a verify, um, you know, uh, are the calls between these two microservices working up? call between here and here working, like how can tell it work without necessarily introducing the complexity to the problems. If I say stub, I think we're familiar with what stub is. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay. 
Um, why might you want to stub things? You want to check like a specific area, and you know if you have errors, if you have all these dependencies, it might be very hard to pinpoint exactly where it's coming from. Yeah. So if you want to only look at that specific area that has to do with your internal application without looking at any of the third parties, then it might be a good idea to stop them. Yeah, okay. You're going to say something? Um, you, can also, you can also use something to save quite significant amounts of money. If you have a lot of tests and you make a huge amount of API calls, mm -hmm. then you're going to rack up huge bills. So stubbing is financially valid as well as allowing you to uh, actually make sure your testing gets full versions of any APIs that you're using because you can check all the different kind of return and call um, formats that they have against their documentation and make sure that you work with all of them rather than just like a specific one that someone looked up. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we buy a number of API requests to different people. If we're running a load of tests, tests are very automated, you can run a lot of them quickly. If you run a load of them against people who are expensive, we're kind of wasting money. Specifically, I'm, really, I'm not really going to touch on performance testing here, but if we had an environment where you'd have, I think people probably know about Gatling, maybe? Okay, so there are performance tools that allow um, um, an environment to be under a certain load of certain thousand users and you can emulate an environment being, being stressed. But if that environment was calling out to real third parties, you'd be burning through a lot of your requests and you'd be spending a lot of money, but you wouldn't be gaining from it. And also they might go down, you might have to then say, yes, because we sent you 50,000 requests in a minute and they, they might not be able to handle it. So, um, and I think an important thing is you can, you can control it. So if you want to um, emulate a situation where you know, a certain third party's down, you can let your stub say, actually, I'm not down, I'm always going to return a 500, and you can see how you, your um, enterprise reacts to it and handles that, and is the user showing the right thing, and how does it work? It, it gives you that ability. Um, and I'm going to talk about the, the ops work we do, and again, this is um, at more. Um, have people heard of Jenkins? Yes. What does Jenkins do? Continuous integration tool for ensuring that um, your code is still working after any changes that you committed, and it still works with your previous code base. Yeah, it, it's it's kind of a trick question because Jenkins does anything you write code and tell it to. It, it basically runs scripts that you say go go run the script, and a lot of people build things that work with Jenkins. So you don't have to write anything. Um, there are a lot of tools that do like delivery of tools and all things like that. In this example, we are using Jenkins. But um, we can write that, so we can write a job that says, go and put this code in this environment. And that's the same as going to put it in this environment. So we know <coughs> when we're going to put it in production, that actual deploy is, is worked here, it's worked there, and it will work here. And it gives us that assurity that it's actually the same code that is being written to put a, you know, a number of object elements, so in a number of um, containers and the view and all of the other stuff in, into a production environment. And we know it's going to stay up when we're deploying. We know that it's being tested after we deploy so users can get it to work. Um, if Jenkins does anything that you write code and tell it to do, it's, it's a very versatile tool. Um, we haven't talked about logging either. Um, the amount of logs that can be produced by all this is quite astounding, really. Um, and we can use tools such as Elk. I don't know if people have heard of Elk around the room. Um, so Elk is... Um, uh, it's, it's kind of three tools, Elasticsearch, Lodestash, and Kibana. It basically is um, an aggregation of logs that allow you to search things in a readable way. So if you imagine, in this example, we've got five here, uh, but you can build this using something called Kubernetes in a way where you might say, give me five of them, give me two of them, give me two of them, and all those logs you can send to help. And it means as a dev, if you're saying, if a tester comes along and says, this isn't working, you can go and help and you'd say, Give me your application ID. You could put it into um, Kibana, and then you could see the logs of that application. And it means you don't have to go on the boxes in these environments and tail the log files that are coming out of it. Especially because if there's five, or in this case, I think we have 20 or 40 of these pods, you'd have to work out which pod it's going to. And every time the person refreshes the page, it might be going to a different place. And tracking that would be impossible. So we push out all the logs to a certain place, and it allows everyone to understand them and see them. And it can also um, plot graphs, so you can see how many logs are 
having um, uh, like uh, being pushed out to, to out in a certain way, and if that's suddenly decreasing, you, you notice that after deployment, you can have a look at um, Kibana and see. You can say, show me all the number of 500s in production. If that suddenly starts going up, you think it could be a problem here. Let me find out. And it's a way of, of seeing that. And there's a lot of data to go through. That'd be very difficult to find something like this. Um, Kind of talk about these together. But, um, this is an AWS tool that allows you to see your databases. Basically, it's uh, CloudWatch. Uh, App Dynamics is another tool that we use that gives you. Um, so this sits on things like Help and CloudWatch, and it, it's a monitoring tool that is absolutely fantastic at what it does. Um, and it, can, it, it, it um, listens to your help, help of your applications. So does this have? Is this up? Um, is, it, is it healthy? Is it having how much memory is it drawing? How much CPU is it drawing? Um, it can listen to things like else. So it can say how much logging is going on, how much logging of different types of things is going on, uh, and then it can put um, alerting to Slack. This is the new Slack over here, um, and that's great. I put Slack in here. It's not really a tool we build actually, but everyone is. I, I'm assuming everyone knows Slack. We use Slack. Yeah. Um, so if everyone's writing and talking in Slack. And then an app dynamics message pops onto a group saying, pods down. You find out pretty quickly because it's right there. It's not on some dashboard in an office that you look at every now and then. Um, and it takes that level of. Um, humans are great at, at, at building stuff, but I, I would never trust a human to always stare at a screen the whole time because we can't, we can't do that. So we have something like app dynamics and Slack integration, and we build that <coughs> Slack integration to work with the client Slack instance that pushes things to a, a, a channel that supports uh, the application that we'd like to support to you. That if this has gone wrong, or if this is in a funny state, it's a warning or it's an error, and you get a response pretty quickly if something like that happens, and people see it straight away because they're actively working in that channel. Um, a really good example of this, actually, is for this particular client. Uh, yesterday, we got, and so after now it creates a baseline, and it kind of learns and sees your logging and creates a baseline of what's normal. Um, and yesterday pushed an alert to Slack saying, we've got a really low number of users from China. Is everything OK? Um, and actually, it was fine, because China is new at the moment, and there's just less people. Um, but, it, but it works. It, like, it's, it's a way of seeing what's going on in prod, because you can't see it. It's too big to really see what's going on. And tools like this, like this kind of methodology that we build, allow us to understand the, the movement of what's going on in prod at scale. Um, and the last tool that I'll kind of give an example of page duty, it's uh, um, a tool that the live service team use if anything does happen, which is rare. It's a routing tool to make sure people are told out of hours. If, if a project is doing that, if people are willing to you know, be on call out of hours, then that, that is also how that's communicated as well. Sorry, what did you say again? Pager duty. Pager duty. Um, who has? Oh, um, I've got another really creepy slide. So <laughs> <laughs> shall I just remove? But, but it has it reminded me to talk about the, the customer. So within, I think this probably between concept of pieces of paper to um, we have something up and running quickly, and then we scaled out. And we've been there for over three years now, and we've evolved from not just building this, but actually building more of what the, the client uh, is now requesting for. But we've scaled this, um, we've had 4.5 million people go through the system. We've in this, this application form is in 210 countries across the globe. Um, it's in use, it can handle 80,000 applicants a day plus. Um, the client pay for the infrastructure they use only, something like Kubernetes scales these as they're needed. So if, if there's a lot of Christmas hitting this, and your CPU is getting high. Kubernetes will just create more Docker pods, and the average CPU on each pod will go down until it's stable. And you pay for what you use. So it's, it's smart tech, and it's used all over the all over the world at the moment. That's kind of what I want to talk about. Different architecture, a few examples of different clients. What is specifically what SI do is more around getting quality assured things into production. So how it kind of goes from uh, this kind of world to this kind of world and the kind of tools that we can use in order to know that production is in a good, healthy state and how it works and, and 
there are any more questions, then please ask me. Just out of curiosity, obviously you mentioned Kubernetes for your containerization, you know, you're using Yelp stack around Elasticsearch, Elasticsearch, Logstash, etc. Are these skills shared across the whole team, or is there very specific pockets within, you know, your function that look after those aspects? Um, I imagine it feeds into DevOps, which you started yeah. with, but is that just a constant skill set across the team, and that's the expectation, or? So, Agile principles say, teams should be self-sufficient. Um, so not, not all teams need to build Elk. We, we have Elk, we've built it, but all teams should know how to integrate what they're doing into Elk. Mm -hmm. So <coughs> each team, let's say the team is just building this one, each team can go, right, I know what I need to build, it, and I don't need specific DevOps people, or I have the specific DevOps people in this team to allow me to do the right thing. It's just that kind of a transfer of knowledge from the original teams that would have built it in the first place. And then the ongoing just kind of feeds into that. Is that a correct assumption from me there? Yeah. Say it was originally built, and then there's just an appreciation of how it all works and links in within the specific aspects of the project. Yes. So we we have a, a team of people that basically, uh, and some people sit within teams depending on what we're doing. We have a team of people with a skill set that gets all this stuff and gets it working and allows allows people to build the platform. Um, and there are other teams of people that do more of the writing of the code here, and other people do more of the writing of the code here and here. And it's, um, people have a bit of an understanding of everything, but people generally specialise in different parts. Um, as someone coming from Makers, I, I wouldn't expect you to go, I know exactly what I'm going to write code for for the rest of my life, and that's not the ask either. So it's, it's, it's transferable. Um, you mentioned that uh, because of the Kubernetes cluster, the system is scalable up to 80,000 uh, forms per day. Uh, but uh, I'm just wondering if, well, what's stopping you from scaling more? Is it just that you've never had an, uh, an amount of users overlap, so you don't know and can't kind of claim that it's infinitely scalable? Uh, I'd never use the word infinitely. <laughs> um, so we, we have content that lives somewhere here. It's Kubernetes saying to Docker, I, I want a minimum of 20 of these pods and a maximum of 40. And it'll hit 40 and then we'll hit a limit and it'll go over. There's nothing stopping us from saying, I want a maximum of 500 of these pods if we'll just scale. And then we'll find a bottleneck somewhere else. You, you always have bottlenecks, you just move them around as you, as you scale. Um, the next bottleneck we might have is a database. We use AWS as a database called RDS. And you just say, give me a bigger box. In, coding language called Terraform we use, and it will give you a bigger box, and then you can test it against the bigger database. But you, you just move bottlenecks around, you will always have the, the, the better development. Um, but there, that also comes with cost. If we're saying to the client, actually, we would be capable of supporting a site that would have millions and millions of people a second, the client might go, just in case anything goes, goes wrong, don't do that, because it's, it sounds expensive. So do um, SI take it from start to finish, like they, they handle all the technical integration, testing, environment, production, so it's like a central central back control. Yeah, so a lot of what we do is building this, these kind of environments, what we do is building the test infrastructure around it. A lot of what some people do is building the test around it as well. And we're actually, I think a lot of people are running unit tests, you have different kind of tests that you run here, different kind of tests that you run here. You have tests that you run before it gets to here at compilation time. And there's, there's ways of testing here before you really reveal your changes out to everyone in the world as well. Um, so a lot of what we do is, is TDDs, it's test driven work. And a lot of what we do is um, infrastructure and architecture and, and, and building the platforms. So you're doing pay all the time. Sorry, all the time. Maybe not all the time, but it is an important part of um, well, learning and productivity. Does it wait if you've got seniors and, and juniors? Is it, does it matter about the difference in level? So, the light has a lot of people in, and everyone will run a team in a slightly different way. It would be impossible to say, this is exactly the way all the light teams work, so the reality is all works within their means and does what they uh, believe is the right thing to do to build a team. Um, it's not a hierarchical place. There are some people that um, Bit more experience, but you don't have that specific bit of tech experience. So people work together, people collaborate. Um, we 
you don't have a team of really junior people by themselves. Um, yeah. Any uh, any yeah. uh, Do you feel like you have creative freedom working for a company like this? Yeah. We've a lot of our stuff. We've come along and said, you know, the client saying this, and actually this would be a better way of doing it. Um, you don't always, and in, in business, because of you know people need paying, you can't always in any company go, I'm just going to do this. Um, but we have the ability to um, suggest ways of working and how we're doing things, and um, client take into that. Sometimes the clients say, we appreciate you want to build this in Scala. Actually, we, we really want this in Java because we're going to build a Java house, um, which happens sometimes. But I, I think that would be the same in any company. What was the journey or integration that made his code into Mono into Evergreen? What was the journey? Yeah, like his integration into like from getting from make, from leaving Matrix to being part of Kaleo, being like a functional part of the team. Yeah. That was his journey. That was so between when we said yes, come and join us, and yeah. between him walking through the door. Yeah, and a little bit of like his first days. Like how does that happen? So. Um, <coughs> Well, I can talk about who you'll meet tomorrow. The, the last intake we had, we brought in three people. Um, they came in and we did a number of um, setup and admin things that are, I'm sure, very exciting to, to every company. Um, you get your laptop, you have the photo taken to get a pass and that, that kind of thing. Um, and then there's a training course, and we'll talk about um, uh, different skill sets, what people want to do. Um, and for the last batch of people we brought in, we said, um, here are the projects with roles that will interest you. That sounds good. Um, one person is working uh, in the um, um, <coughs> private sector, working uh, on an e-commerce uh, site, and they are they basically want to build a business around how to create automation around things like uh, SAP and e e-commerce things. Uh, I can't talk too much about that because I really don't know a lot about e-commerce. Um, someone else is working for a bank that are digitizing their whole stack. Not the bank that we talked about, this was a global bank, a really big bank, uh, and they're digitizing what they're doing. Um, and the third person is working on this client with myself and uh, um, helping automate all this. I think you actually took your mind off it So I check in with these people every week and ask them, well, these people, the matrix on the Expanding the ability to run end-to-end -end tests in parallel, so that's parallelizing the end-to-end -end tests, so that the automated test process went down from more than 31 minutes to less than 10 minutes. Actually, he says six minutes, but I don't know whether really six minutes. That's pretty cool. Um, uh, but also uh, an opportunity to learn how to create automated tests from scratch for one new product. Um, so he's doing a lot of testing at the moment, but go back a few weeks, the other stuff he was talking about was learning different other bits of kinds of tooling and so on, um, and I'm imagining there's going to be some containerization stuff happening soon. Um, so and it's really interesting to get a, the insight like that. Of, it's not just about the first sort of few weeks and the first few months, but that's week 18. How many months is that? I can't divide by four. So four and a bit. Four and a bit. There we go. Yeah. So that's nearly six months in, and, and that's the kind of amazing stuff that's happening. So the funny thing about that is we had a load of tests that the client had written and they were running in series and we had parallel Jenkins deals with each one was running in series. Uh, this person then paralyzed everything and it all run against all, all these environments at the same time and then it broke all of our environments because it couldn't handle the load that we have four new tests running in parallel that just shut our environments down. So we now have a job to fix them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I guess the take homes are there's a lot of variety in what to do. These are two clients we have to load around the globe. There's, there's a huge amount of variety in what to do. Um, there's a huge amount of variety in the clients, the um, different sectors of work, the techs that you use. Um, we're, we're a family, we bring people into the family, um, and we enjoy learning. Not everyone we work with knows everything about everything, and it's the evolution of what we know and how we can build better things for clients that we work with. Uh, 
The answer is, uh, I don't know, so you I'm kind of, um, in my career I haven't counted it yet, there will be a load of people at Deloitte that haven't counted it, and I'm sure if um, well, it's a partnership, so every partner owns the little pocket of the firm, there's a partner here, we'd be like, actually there's a load of bids that you don't know about that people speak to us and we don't want to do because of the way they want to do it, and it's not right, but that, that would never go to me saying, can you build something that we can then bring to a client and, and design but I highly suspect the answer is we don't work with people for certain reasons. Um, but that just never goes as far as we can see. Um, not as important, but do you guys have like a dress code? <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess if we worked, if we started working with an investment bank and they were really serious about having to wear suits, potentially, that's never crossed my mind. Um, so the day to day you don't. Uh, we sell our culture as part of the business work we do with clients. We sell our culture. We say, hey, we're a large scale agile delivery team. This is the way the way we work. And the client, um, you, you see on long term projects, initially you will see your client people kind of wearing suits and they're thinking, oh, just wearing jeans and a t shirt. I'm not sure what's going on. And then a year later, they're wearing jeans and a t shirt. <laughs> <laughs> you see all the time. Thank you. 